Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fret Buzz, the podcast. I'm Aaron Sefcik. I'm Joe McMurray. And today we're going to talk a little bit about some bass. Uh, today with us, we have Randy Nicholas. Hi, Randy. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, yeah, welcome. Uh, Thank Randy's, you very much. Yeah, Randy's, uh, he's been playing bass for quite some time. Uh, I've known Randy for years. Uh, played with him quite a few times. He's got his own brand that we'll talk about today. Um, yeah, just an all-around cool dude. You're definitely going to want to learn more about him and get to know him. Check him out. Yeah, so, if you can't see him, you got to check out his beard. Yeah. Yeah. Click <laughs> on the YouTube link. <laughs> awesome. So welcome, Randy. Oh, thank you guys for having me. Um, Very nice morning. Yeah, well, maybe for you. Not yeah, it's not nice here. here. It's oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a, kind of nasty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, so let's waste no time. I actually want to jump right in. I got lots of things that we could talk about. Um, one of the first things that I definitely want to jump into is um, base and how it's viewed. Um it is my perception just from my experience over the years that going back to even something like Led Zeppelin and you look at the, all the old Led Zeppelin videos and everything like that, they'll show Robert Plant and they'll see Jimmy Page and occasionally you'll see John Bonham doing his thing. But the one person that you never, ever see, and, and this, this goes for almost all videos that you see, especially in the older times, is you never see the bassist. Yeah. Um, it's rather interesting when you actually start paying attention to just that. The bassist is never, ever, like, the one who gets the attention. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that kind of interesting, that the bass doesn't ever really get that spotlight. Um, yes. and, it, and it really wasn't until Jocko came along that it was like, ooh, bass. Um, <laughs> um, so it's kind of interesting. And even like where I work um, and, and people who come through the door, you know, it's always guitarists who want to learn. And then beyond that, it would be drummers and then maybe some piano players. But the the one person who doesn't that like the that doesn't come through the door is the bassist. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of wondering what your thoughts are on, on that. Um, I mean, they're pretty right. Uh, the bass player is often the unsung hero, kind of the kind of the joke. You know, you get a lot of fun poked at you for being the bass player. Um, <laughs> it's terrible. You know, it's such a cool instrument. Yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> you have that meme that's like a uh, guitar player, and he's going home with like three girls, and then like the drummer's going home with two. Yeah, and then the singer's going home with one, and then the bass player just going home with his bass. Right. Um, <laughs> which pretty much described my whole high school slash college career. <laughs> <laughs> because i love to practice yeah but um i mean you're definitely right about jaco that dude changed the game yeah um, but did, did jaco change the game because he was playing the melodies he was not a lot of times he got famous for playing what isn't typically the bass role right i i would say that too i mean just right especially being a fretless player because that wasn't as common i mean unless you're playing an upright i guess at the time yeah um but definitely, like you said, yeah, I would I would say him playing the melodies and his like technique and his sound. I mean, when you listen to his like tone, it was just crazier than any other bass players. Yeah, I mean, you know, same with thing with like Getty Lee too. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that was just completely different. I mean, don't get me wrong, John Paul Jones and and like Paul McCartney, they had amazing bass lines. Oh yeah. But they weren't like the spotlight. They they didn't really have that that. I don't know they they should have had a bigger role um i don't know how to explain it it's it's it like i said it was, really wasn't until jocko came along that he had that kind of like you said joe as well that melody that kind of put the spotlight on bass and everybody's kind of like oh okay but not that it wasn't right. around but it was just like oh okay here's somebody who's kind of making it the voice of the band right yeah, I mean, listening to his stuff with like Joni Mitchell, same way. It was just yeah. like it was like wow, like definitely never heard that before. And I feel like it made a lot of people probably go like, oh, I'm gonna play the bass now. Yeah, and it also made us kind of look back on things like you know people like James Jamerson, mm -hmm. or you know, and and like even Paul McCartney's bass lines or um, um, John Entwistle from the Who. Yeah, like yeah, and then you start to go back and listen to these guys that like were kind of underappreciated. I mean, even John Paul Jones, man. Uh, 
ramble on. Like that <laughs> bass line is so good. Yeah. It's so good. Um, so I think that guy definitely started making people appreciate it. And then when, like, I mean, from what I've studied, like well, as soon as we hit the eighties, like all these crazy jazz fusion players came out yeah, and they were just like blowing minds. And, you know, then you get guys like Victor Wooten coming on oh, man. and then he's like the best in the world. Yeah. And, uh, that that really like made me want to pick it up because by the time i was like 12 i'd gotten a job and i bought my first base yeah um yeah and i just remember like look like the internet was becoming a thing so i was like able to see these guys like flee was like my first one that i loved yep um Let's but, play pool. yeah oh yeah yeah my cousin gave me a Primus CD when I was 13, and I was like, what in the hell <laughs> is this? It was so weird, and I'm not going to lie, I hated it at first. Yeah. But then a couple listens through, and like I started kind of really getting into like myself a little bit and figuring out what I liked in life, Yeah. and Primus was definitely that. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Such a weird – it was like – I was like, what is this circus music, dude? Yeah. This is yeah. so weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was the same way. I picked yeah. up that first album, and I was just like, what is – this such a different approach to music and it's quirky and it's fun and it's just out there and the way he approaches is because again here's a band that that focuses on the bass right and and it's like wow it, but it's not like a regular <laughs> bass oh, no. No. Like, less is like out there man and it's awesome it was so i mean i played pork soda so many times oh it's, yeah man frizzle fry too that, oh, that was my, my jam for oh sure. man such a good album yeah and then sailing the seas of cheese was like oh, every song on there was a classic to me yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah bass is just kind of interesting that over the years it's it wasn't the spotlight and then like i said as over the years where you have people like jaco and you have getty lee and you have Stu ham and victor oh, right. wooten and and you know, all these cats who are just like okay now bass is definitely a, a big thing and then what i'm noticing again is is that i don't really see that spotlight happening as much anymore we went through a good period where the bassist was you know at least recognized um, but right now I'm not seeing too, I mean, again, as I said in many, many episodes before, <laughs> it's out there. It's just not prominent like it used to be. There's, right. You don't have those guys like Stu Ham or Jocko or any one of these. I mean, you don't have a Les Claypool right now. You just don't have that. It doesn't no. exist. I mean, I think that also has to do <clears throat> with the way music is especially the way like popular music is going you know because <laughs> a lot of that is done electronically right and i mean i get it because you can make some pretty cool like i'm into that too i love production stuff yeah um you can get some pretty cool sounds and i mean essentially like, like with like a, a moog for example like you can get something that's more bass than an electric bass right so like pe right. people want those subwoofer rattling mm -hmm. you know crazy uh big warm room filling bass sounds as opposed yeah. to like an electric bass of course with some pedals you can get that too but i think that may have a lot to do with it because people are just kind of like eh, i don't want to hire a bass player like and eh, let's just make this sweet noise on the computer or with the synthesizer yeah um yeah There's but something... i mean they're out there for sure still sorry to interrupt you joe that's okay i was just gonna say there's something you can't get the the smoothness of an electric bass you know the slides you can't get that on the computer oh no way man i've tried when i'm laying down an idea and it's like okay screw this i just got to pick up my bass and plug it in like <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> kind of funny yeah. i was actually at the moog factory last uh last weekend i was back in near my parents place in the Asheville region for uh thanksgiving and went and did a behind the scenes tour of the Moog factory and oh, I mean, they do have some super awesome uh since it put like these fat bass sounds right i mean super they had fat. some that were like they looked like cabinets i mean that's what they used to take around with them i mean now they've got a lot of them where it's condensed into one keyboard but they had all these old cabinets and stuff oh, was, you man. know 50 little connecting cables you switch them out to make the different sounds, but it's awesome. Oh, yeah, dude. That's killer. Just I've never bit. actually been there yet. I would love to go. 
Yeah, it's worth the stop. It's easy. Downtown Asheville. Mm. Um, yeah, just imagine Herbie Hancock playing that commute. <laughs> <laughs> That's so epic to think about. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right? That's cool, dude. Yeah, especially, I mean, that's weird to me, too. I'm, like, still kind of uh, intimidated by those. Like, I've definitely seen guys on tour with not really huge ones, but, I mean, there's guys that literally, you know, there's a whole band playing instruments, and then there's, like, there was this one band we played with. I forget what they were called, but there, there was one guy in the band who was literally just sitting there patching cables, mm -hmm. like, while a oh. dude was playing the synth. Yeah, right. it was pretty wild looking. And I was like, whoa, there's some weird sounds coming out of that thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That's, that's yeah. the appeal of it. You can really get sounds that nobody else can get. Yeah. Like, you got to just turn a lot of knobs. Yeah. yeah was, essentially. <laughs> when I was at school, I had a roommate who was uh, from Italy, and that's what he was pretty much there for, is just kind of manip manipulation of sound in real time. And that was his live show, was, you know, kind of going through the filters and using this sawtooth and using, Whoa. I mean, that's, I mean, that's all he did on stage and, uh, you know, put a beat behind it. And that's, that's what it was all about, is expl exploration of sound and, and, and having fun with it. It's, it's mm -hmm. kind of, kind of an interesting way to look at um, the live show. Right. Cool. I was going to say, I wonder if there's people like crowd surfing there and like mosh pit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it's it's kind of like that electronic uh, um, uh, sound that, that, that that's very popular over in the Europe. So, oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, that's pretty wild, man. Yeah, it was like, it was cool. You know, you would think with the electronic music being so popular these days and like especially music that's danceable, you would think that the bass would get a bigger spotlight <clears throat> because oh, of that yeah i mean um, it it you can just have drum and bass and have a great you know great dance rhythm section yeah but like randy was saying it's kind of about that sub bass it's around like 30 hertz to like 60 hertz and where you can kind of like feel it whereas i see bass as like 80 to a just a little bit higher yeah 80 to you know anything up to I don't know, 250. It's right. like an uh, octave high, right? Yeah. It's a, and, and beyond because you have obviously you can go way up high on the on, yeah. the on the base, but it's it's um and it generally tendency with with um with sub bass, uh, you don't have a lot of quick lines. It's it's kind of whole notey, half notey, kind of and sometimes the entire song is just one yeah. note, one note, <laughs> yeah. you know, one sub frequency. And you may have a, you might have like a sub drop or something like that. Um, but whereas obviously the bass, you can have a lot of melodic lines. You move around a lot and um, it's got it's got that higher frequency that, that kind of it occupies a little bit more. So I where I do see what you're saying, I just see um, I see dance music a little bit more in that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Feel, yeah. You know? that, was, that was a very good impression, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yeah, right. Because I did a lot of those with like a low octave pedal all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's the way around it. I mean, f five string bass, octave pedals, and it seems like you can still achieve that. Oh yeah. I mean, I think. Um, I guess I also think. Uh, what's the guy's name? The guy who did the sound design for like Star Wars and Wally -E and stuff like that. I forget his name. Legendary dude though. And he talks about how we have this um, categorized part of our brain where we have like um, just a special slot for movie sounds and stuff. Like when you punch someone in that you have that typical like, psh, you know, yeah. like yeah, kind yeah. of sound, which is actually just like them like cracking a piece of celery or something. Yep. Yeah. Um, I feel like we've started to develop that too for music and like especially because electronic music is so prominent every genre you hear has the electronic aspects to it and like i mean every jam band i hear the bass player very rarely is just playing a bass with no effects on it you know right. like if it's dancier it's definitely at least like an oc2 you know or like something like that uh mm -hmm. usually i've seen ones that don't even have a bass player it's just a guy playing synth um yeah but because of that stuff people will start to kind of get the idea that they hear the bass sound and 
it's not actually a bass it's just a synth you know does that right. make sense yeah 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 um i feel like so they've started to kind of get a library for what they believe to be a bass sound and that's what they want to hear so yeah. because that's kind of popular you know it's definitely more um popular to hear a synthesized bass versus a real one yeah or I mean, like I one on the computer or whatever yeah, I'd love to see EDM with a bassist. That'd be great. <laughs> I'll get pretty tight. Yeah, yeah, I would. I feel like there are bands that that definitely get into that arena, though. I mean, if I watch STS Nine, like it, it's got that like it feels like EDM with a live band, which is it's. I like listening to it. I don't want to. I like. See, I would like to see them live. Oh man, have you ever seen them? I have not. No. Oh. <laughs> they just got <laughs> they're so cool dude they just got a uh a chick bass player i forget her name mm -hmm. but she's ridiculously good she was playing gospel before oddly enough too oh yeah yeah she's... and then this electronic jam band's like yo come uh do this edm stuff with us mm -hmm. and they, they sound really good they you're right like they do it they have a really good feel for getting the dance music with an electric bass yeah and i mean electric, i think every real instruments right the whole band yeah and then sometimes they're running samples while they're doing their stuff. Okay. Um, how else was I thinking of? He's got, I mean, part of that comes because the drummer's got a real, like, hip-hop kit. Like, it's mm -hmm. like, he's got the piccolo snare, and he's got, he gets that electronic sound out of his drum kit, too. Right. And he's probably got, I think he's got one of those, like, uh, pad, like, trigger pad things. Right, yeah, yeah. Right, right. right. You know, so he can hit the doom. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's like the roto toms. Or... Okay, right. I got it in, and now Randy's got it in. Now Joe, you have to do it too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um. Also, <laughs> love it. Lettuce gets into some of that too. Oh like, I feel like man, a lot of the recorded oh, stuff wow. isn't necessarily as much like that. But when I've seen them live, um, late night, they, I mean, they get really. I'm what do you call it? Like trance hop. I mean, it's very yeah. It's that's best. a good word for it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna coin that if anybody wants to use it. Oh, man. <laughs> send, yeah, send welcome. No, uh -huh. I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no lettuce. Lettuce definitely gets into it. I think it's a thing that's happening in the. I mean, even on my Sirius XM radio, Jamtronica happens certain nights of the week, which is their electronic jam band stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean. To me, I, like I think that the electric bass actually plays a better role than synthesizer, just if you can, because you just get the expressiveness more. And like mm -hmm. uh, I forget which one of you earlier were saying it, but like getting like the slides, you know, or even just like a muted note, like yeah. that kind of mm -hmm. Jacoby, that kind yeah. of yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Like it's it's a lot harder to achieve for me, at least on the keys. I mean, I know keys players that can do that no problem, You're but right. um, I, I just think it's it's a better fit it just also looks way cooler um yeah. to me <laughs> yeah to, no when i go to a show i want to see like a guy with a bass you know that's what yeah. i like i'm looking at but if i see a guy actually it would be pretty cool to see a guy with like a guitar too <laughs> <laughs> doing some slap on the guitar right <laughs> it's, just, it's easier to dance with a, a guitar like instrument on your around oh, you rather definitely. than being stuck in the keys but so mm. what what kind of bass do you play so i have um my go-to bass is this sweet kudela five string mm -hmm. it's custom made it was made in japan and i actually found it used uh on reverb um yeah. and it's it's five different kinds of woods so oh. i'm not even going to try to list them all because i don't remember exactly what they all are right but um it has Bartolini pickups, uh, 18 volt active preamp, and it weighs seven pounds. So okay. that that was my favorite part about the bass. Like as soon as I saw seven pounds, I was like, ah, this thing looks amazing. Like I don't even care what it is. I just wanted a light bass for tour. Mm -hmm. And then I got it, and it's just a tone monster. It's I mean, I can make it sound like Jaco. I can make it sound thick and warm. Like mm -hmm. it's just honestly the best bass I've ever owned. Mm -hmm. Um. And then my backup bass is a Brewbaker, which is made here in Baltimore um, by a guy named Kevin Brewbaker. <clears throat> and it's a five string too. I typically go with five strings just because, I mean, it's kind of the standard nowadays. I feel like, you know, a lot of times of having that low E flat or that low D, right. just yeah. nice. even just the low B too. It's just nice to have. It just yes. feels better to me. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. But those are my two go-to bases. And then I have a fun one at home as a six-string Ibanez um, okay. premium or prestige. I forget what it's called. Um, but I strictly use that one just to record it with. And honestly, to like learn all my bass chords with because mm -hmm. it's a six-string. So I'm trying to like... You know, learn a bunch of Thundercat lately. <laughs> I love that guy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Thundercat. I know the name. Oh, man. Check him out when you get a chance. He's ri ridiculously good. Um, yeah. Grammy Award winning, like, bassist and singer. Uh, he's worked with people like Eric Abadu. Actually, funny enough, too. So when you listen to his music, you would not expect this, but he was also in suicidal tendencies for a little bit. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty yeah. wild because yeah. his music is like this, like, soul like it's beautiful like neo soul kind of stuff mm. um but he makes it funny so it's like imagine if tenacious d did like soul music okay yeah it's really pretty but it's hilarious like he has songs about his cat which is, his name is tron and like just hilarious things like that um so check out thundercat <laughs> when you get the chance for sure yeah yeah that's awesome man yeah so those are my bases um do you, so you've uh, do you recommend like so if somebody was learning to play bass do you recommend starting on a four string and then moving up to a five string no i recommend them starting on a nine string and moving down to four. <laughs> it feels easier and easier yeah. yeah exactly start hard no i'm just kidding i definitely recommend a four um just because i mean i like to think about the way people's brains work that like don't know anything about it i mean when i was approaching it like a four was just how i uh thought of a bass and that's how most people think of bass you know like when i look in yours in the background there i'd see i knew instantly you know my brain knows that's a bass even if i wasn't mm -hmm. a bass player so to me it's I, I recommend people start on four string for sure do you do you think it's when you move to a five string from a four string is there i mean getting a fatter neck does that mess you up pretty bad for a while and also um, to me that i don't know if that low b string rings out if you're not careful oh yeah definitely does um i mean i got into five string pretty quickly because i saw a bass that i wanted like a year or two into playing and i was just like i don't care if i know how to do that like i need that <laughs> i need that five string it was too beautiful yeah um, yeah and i kept noticing like uh at the time you know i was playing like a lot of rock and roll so like we were tuning down a drop d you know like the teenagers love to do mm -hmm. um and I just got sick of tuning down and then tuning up the next song. And I was just right. like, I just want to get a five string. Yeah. Um, it, but I mean, it me it'll mess you up pretty bad only because it takes a little bit for your hands to get used to. But I mean, like to me, you just have to be willing to suck no matter what, if you're approaching playing music, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean? You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You go through that struggle to play a G chord and then all of a sudden you can like solo within a couple of years, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's just practice thing for sure. And what 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 does your uh, what's your rig look like? My rig? Yeah. Oh man. So um I heard real bass players don't use rigs. <laughs> 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 no, but right? Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I have <laughs> so I have a um <laughs> Yeah, I always tell people too. They're like, "What kind of strings do you use?" I'm like, "I don't use strings. <laughs> <laughs> I just that's, wish my notes into existence." That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. But um, so I use um, I got a 115 cabinet and Ampeg, mm -hmm. and I got a 410 Ampeg cabinet, and I've had both of those since I was like 15 years old. They've yeah. just been super reliable. They sound great, and they're not that heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for my amps, I have. Uh, a backup amp is an Ampeg Portaflex 500, and that thing is cool. I mean, it sounds like a bass amp, you know, mm -hmm. um, made by Ampeg, super reliable, super easy to fix if something goes wrong. Um, but my main one is one that I never knew existed by a company called Quilter. Have you guys ever heard of them? <laughs> no. I have heard of Quilter. Oh, man. Check out Quilter's stuff, dude. They're so good. So I came across this thing on the internet because my amp fry i had an ampeg svt3 mm -hmm. um which is like you know the classic yeah. ampeg sound right and it was all tube and so cool i love that amp but I, I just got it fixed finally actually but um right before tour that thing fried on me 
Wow. Like I was like about to leave that day oh. to go to Colorado. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Right. So went online really quick and uh, found this amp that was like the highest recommended like lightweight amp. And it was made by a company called Quilter. And it's called the Base Block 800. And this thing is probably about this big. It's like three to five pounds, if that. And it's so powerful. 800 watts. There's four knobs on it. They have little graphics over the knobs. So, like, for me, I like simple stuff. Right. And this thing is a powerhouse, dude. It's so, it can get so loud. Um, it just has the best tone that matches my bass. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what bass I plug into, I've fallen in love with that amp. I honestly want to get another one so that I can, like, A, B, two different tones with it and just oh, have wow. a full stage of quilter madness. Yeah, it would be awesome. Um, Does and it then sound I, low at low volumes? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, it has like a little headphone uh, input on it. Oh. It's all the it's all the essentials. It's got your gain, um, master volume, and then it has two what they call contour knobs. Yep. Which mm -hmm. is like it's like your EQs, but um, they have cool they have the, these cool little graphics. I wish I had it with me. I'd show you guys. Um, but they have cool little graphics over top. So like, you know, because sometimes I have a brain that overthinks a lot. So if mm -hmm. I look at an amp with 10 knobs, I'm just like, oh, man, sometimes it's intimidating. I know what all of them do, but sometimes I'm like, I don't want to read words right now. I'm on stage. There's lights flashing. Everywhere. So when I look over at that little guy and there's just two knobs I can mess with, you know, that aren't just volume and gain. I'm like, oh, OK, this little picture is right there. And this is nice for my simple mind because right. I, I just need it like that. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, and then moving forward. Um, so I. I use all Fender Custom Shop cables too. I love those. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, the braided kind because yeah. they just wrap nice and easy. Yep. Which, uh, you know, we all know at the end of the night that's the tough part, wrapping <laughs> cables and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> got to um, take care of cables, man. <laughs> right. And then I just got this pretty sweet tone snob pedal board uh, mm -hmm. with like a case and stuff. Um, it's the fanciest thing I've ever had. I just built my own before mm -hmm. um, with like dresser drawer handles on it and stuff. But uh, awesome. it works, man. Ah, yeah. oh, dude, it, it does. <laughs> I actually knew a couple of guys in in one of my old bands. Well, he knew a guy, but he actually got these old uh sewing uh like a sewing machine case. It looked like a little mini suitcase. Oh yeah, they steam made, rose. It's that it makes you a great uh pedal board. Oh you yeah, dude. Wood in there, and it's you put your power source underneath. It's a little small for you know. It's only like I don't know, foot and a foot and a half maybe by right a little over a foot right yeah, you can make some cool i've seen some cool custom pedal boards for sure oh man that's a way better idea than what i used <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah i just got this nice fancy one it looks like looks like an old school like 50s like chevy car it has like a racing stripe on it <laughs> um, nice awesome yeah and then uh so i got like um let's see what did i have chord pitch black tuner mm -hmm. uh, which i love because they're very easy to read mm -hmm. I got an MXR compressor, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. It's very versatile. I use it mostly as a boost now. Um, right. But when I was doing, you know, a lot of between like slap and then regular technique, like just on the fly, that compressor came in, in handy. Um, so when you're slapping it, it really helps kind of hone in the sound the compressor does. Yeah. And, you know, I noticed that with the brew baker and other bases, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's just a technique thing. Like, I don't like to try and rely on the pedal, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, I've just been, I've only been learning slap for like the past like two or three years, like really actually getting into it. So I noticed when I do it live, you know, the sometimes the volume just isn't there. So the people mm -hmm. say, you know, use the compressor. Um, but with the Kudela, that bass I was telling you guys, my main bass, yeah. uh, I don't even need it like it's because it's got two batteries it's it's 18 volts and i mean it, that thing cranks. wow yeah yeah wow yeah. okay cranks yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not messing around <laughs> no i didn't even honestly i didn't even know that and i like was playing around on it one day and i don't know if you guys are familiar with like active electronics but like you know it yeah. kind of has that starts yeah. to fart out a little yep. bit yep um and I was like, oh, my God. And I opened up the back and I was like, whoa, there's two batteries in here. Holy <laughs> cow. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and then I have a bunch of fun pedals. Like I got a 
um i got a uh what is it sound blocks pro envelope filter mm -hmm. um which has like a bunch of cool programmable stuff about it mm -hmm. um i mostly just use it for comms. quacking yeah, yeah i mostly just use it. but it actually so the cool thing about <clears throat> this one is uh they they also make a distortion pedal mm -hmm. and they make this thing called hot hands which is like this little magnet uh it's like this little cloth ring thing you put on your finger and then it has a magnet in it that allows you to like you can essentially create like this dubstep bass like wow 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 kind of stuff really it's, yeah it's really tight dude um the company is called uh source audio and they're the only people that have it i think they like patented it and i believe right. um the singer slash uh, i don't know what you call her like a sound engineer like she created a lot of stuff her name's imogen heap she created this like bodysuit that like she just can move and it like creates pitches and <laughs> changes the oh dude it's so crazy you gotta look wow. up imogen heap one day she is like a genius she's helped develop like all these crazy things in the synth synth world and stuff awesome yeah but exactly. i believe she had something to do with developing this little thing um i used to have one the only problem is the ring is like you know really small uh so if you lose it it's really <laughs> hard to find it's like a guitar pick but very expensive <laughs> that's funny um but yeah so i i just have the uh um the envelope filter on my board and then i have octave pedals for days like i love the pog because if I take a bass solo, you know, I'm, it sounds really cool. It gives you that kind of reverby uh, sound too. And then, but the the main one I used, um, like with Broccoli Samurai for sure, was the OC2, which is the low octave. You can even go two mm -hmm. octaves below with that. You just got to be nice and careful. And make sure you have a system that can handle it. Because right. if, if you don't, you're not going to hear anything. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's pretty much my rig. All right. Cool. Um, for right now yeah and you use that on tour with broccoli samurai yes sir <laughs> and how long were you on the road with those guys so i was on the road for <clears throat> almost a year wow um yeah and it's kind of a crazy story because um my friend mike actually he toured with a band called mr f and they did 12 days in colorado together and something happened with him and uh he called me and he was like man you got there's an opportunity like you gotta take because i've been kind of looking for a, an established band that just needed a bass player and i was like i just want to go tour i want to try it out and mm -hmm. see yeah. if i can yeah, yeah. and i've been looking and looking and um then I, this you know this name popped up and i was like i've heard broccoli samurai like i'm pretty sure i've seen them and i remembered to a year prior i'd seen them in baltimore and i was like they were good but I really wish that I was playing bass for them the whole time I was watching them. Right. Um, so anyways, yeah. So we got together in November last year and I auditioned and then uh, I got in and it was just weird because these three dudes from Ohio, you know, picked a dude from Maryland. Right. Mm -hmm. They even drove to where I was teaching at the time uh, at the Frederick Rock School to audition me. And then, uh, and then I went to their show in Baltimore that night. We hung out hit it off and then they were like yeah dude we want you full time awesome um so i played one date in cleveland uh to kind of like just you know get used to how it was because i had no idea what i was getting into and to be honest i didn't even really know these guys mm -hmm. right um right. yeah but we just headed off the musical chemistry was there um and then from there i had like a month to learn a, all the rest of the material that i didn't play at the show Right. And we wrote some new stuff like on the spot. That was just kind of we treated it sort of like a jazz band because uh, my guitar player and my drummer were actually jazz musicians as well. Mm -hmm. Like they studied at University of Akron and um, um, I'm not sure about Bruce. I think he was mostly self-taught. He was he was dope, too. Um, but then, yeah, we, we hit it hard. January 31st was our second date, but like our first date of like tour. Um, and that was in Colorado, which I'd never even been there before. Right. I yeah. mean, I imagine, I imagine that whole experience of just meeting new people and then jumping on tour with them and playing shows is <laughs> intimidating and, and nerve wracking <clears throat> and, and just, wow. I mean, that talk about like just jumping into the ether. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. It was, it was like jumping into like i mean yeah ether or like a pool where you didn't know if the bottom was 
10 inches down or a hundred thousand right. feet right or if you were going to get sucked into a wormhole honestly like yeah it was it was pretty wild and it was definitely intimidating yeah um just not knowing them um you know and being like wow these guys have been doing this forever and this is my first time like mm. you know the i think the drummer was the newest in comparison to me but he had still been touring with this band for two years right but at the end of the day i just kept trying to remind myself like dude you've been playing music for like 16 years so like right. even though you haven't toured your main part of your job is going to play music so like you've got this yeah. and but i had never played in front of crowds like that um getting to play with like like especially this one band uh they're called pigeons playing ping pong and they're yeah, really yeah. blowing up right now right yeah you know pigeons or... yeah so we got to like open for them a bunch of times and awesome. that was huge shows like to me like you know it was like 500 sometimes like a thousand people and wow. i mean those guys sell out every show so mm -hmm. like us getting to open was like holy crap it wasn't like people were waiting outside for pigeons either they were coming in because you know they they're there for pigeons but they it, that's the cool thing i think about the jam scene too is that, uh people are always they were always so supportive like of whether we were opening or if we had an opening band you know they were there the whole time supporting yeah. every act that's and, cool that's yeah cool. you know sometimes you get the people that are like uh screw the opener like we're just going for this one you know one act and then we're out of there before they're done right you know which i understand too sometimes um because <clears throat> you know sometimes you just want to go to bed or whatever but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you but, gotta yeah. be supportive man it's all about supporting the bands it really is i mean yeah. if you're into jam band music you're into hearing new things and you want them to to improvise and go off the beaten path i mean yeah, it makes right. sense that you'd want to hear the other band yeah I'm, I'm always searching for new new good music yeah man i mean you're wearing an umpre shirt i would assume so yeah. those guys are killer i got to open for them once too at a oh, mountain music man. festival oh man that was that was very intense <laughs> yeah. like you know That's i awesome. was like in the middle of a a bass solo in this one song um that we actually it was a lotus song that we used to cover called mm -hmm. greet the mind and I always started it with like a bass solo thing because my, my guitar player just was like throwing me the stuff. He'd be like, yeah, take a solo, take a solo. And I'm like, dang, I'm not used to this, you know, like mm -hmm. I got put in the center of the stage with this band, too. So that was pretty <laughs> that was pretty cool because, like, you know, that thing you guys were bringing up earlier, like, is the bass the center? It was so weird for me because, like. I've always been down to just chill in the back you know like especially right. like learning jazz like i was like tucked in the corner of like a restaurant if we were playing or like yeah. you know just yeah. sort of knowing my part because the job of the bass players you know you're foundation you're glue, but yeah, yeah. The, you're the foundation and you're the part that like a lot of times isn't seen you know i think about the foundation the way that like it's the foundation of a house yeah N nobody compliments your foundation of your house right you know what i mean yeah. you're not digging up your dirt to be like yeah check out how sweet my foundation is you know <laughs> <laughs> people right. are looking at your walls and the paint and everything um but yeah then i got in this band and from the first show i was like you know where how do you guys set up or whatever and they were like well this is how we used to do it but like i guess after practicing because i i get into it i like dancing and you know jumping mm -hmm. around stuff like that and they they were kind of like, well, we're boring. We're putting you in the middle. Ah. Uh, not that they're boring, but like my guitar player literally said that to me. And I was like, oh, man, are you are you for real? Like the yeah. bass player gets to be in the middle. This is yeah. crazy, dude. So from there on out, that's how it was. But anyways, uh, getting back to this mountain music festival thing. Right? Opening for Humphreys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was just that was a very intimidating moment because I knew they were there. I'd seen the dudes unloading all their stuff from their uh from their trailer or whatever right and i remember being in the middle of a bass solo <clears throat> and like i kind of peeked around like that <laughs> <laughs> and i saw like uh i forget their names but definitely the bass player and a couple other people and then dudes from like perpetual groove were like whoa who's this kid and i was just like oh man don't choke dude all right all right <laughs> Turn back around and keep playing. I was like, I cannot look at them right now. All right, right. Yeah. Focus, 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 focus. <laughs> a huge crowd over looking at musicians I admire, like while I'm playing any day. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, oh man, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. Umphreys to me is like got to be one of the tightest jam bands. Like, I mean, I love I love Fish a lot, but Fish is more of an exploratory experience. I feel like 
and Umphreys does do that in live shows, but they have this, I think it's because they're like metal background, some of them, but it's so, so tight, like synchronized licks and things. I really enjoy listening to them. Oh yeah, man. I mean, and to me, like, uh, that's a, that's a cool thing you bring up because that's like two extremes, you know, that you probably would see playing a festival together, you know, like mm-hmm. in the bill, like headlining. Yeah. But like, I'm personally more of an Umphreys guy just because like I have more of a metal background, you know, I have a beard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I love fish too. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Wait, did you ask me a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think I was just I was just, just reminiscing about fish and Umphreys. talking talking about how Umphreys is, you know, tight. It really impresses yeah. me to watch yeah. Umphreys. Yeah, they impress me too. And I mean, actually, uh, I, I saw them at the Anthem with Marcus King. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a great show. I also love Marcus King. He uh, is so awesome. He's young, right? He, he's probably like 22 or 23 right now yeah they have such a good like soulful blues rock oh. he's like a little mini warren haynes is how i oh yeah i mean warren the haynes. voice and the es335 oh yeah dude and oh and whatever amp he uses is just freaking glory mm-hmm. um but apparently warren haynes kind of took him under his wing for sure that makes sense yeah but oh, I, I was watching videos of them yesterday just like oh man they sound so good Oh yeah, man. There's this one. Uh, uh, have you ever heard of Jam in the Van? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they do one, and they play one of my favorite songs uh, called "Plant Your Corn Early." Check that out, dude. Okay. The whole band is just funky and tight. Almost everybody gets a solo. It's a great tune. Plant your corn early. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Awesome. Mar- Marcus King band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another good one um, <clears throat> that I like is Wolfpack. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're sick. <laughs> Their bass player is really fun to. I mean, I love listening to him. I love yeah. the whole band, but the bass playing is—he's like the only guy who doesn't switch instruments. Right. Yeah. Like right. really good at the bass. Yeah, I mean that's actually. Uh, so for a long time, me personally, like I've strived to sound like Jaco. Yeah. And then uh-huh. I realized one day that was just so impossible to do because I- <laughs> it's Jocko. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, it, it, you know, you get to a point where you sound like them, but you're never going to sound like that because you right. sound like you. Right. That's exactly right. But definitely when Joe Dark came out, I was just like, oh, my God, a guy like, like we, you know, same exact style, like uh, everywhere I've played not to brag but like i love when people come up and they're like dude you sound just like joe dart you sound just like the guy from wolfpack i'm like mm-hmm. yes that's what i want because that's yeah. super funky yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah super funky that's it's such a good sound it really yeah. is <laughs> yeah god they i love it when they bring in antoine to sing uh oh, his last yeah. name he does like 16 12 and funky ducks and uh there's there's a couple new. They think they just released like a new album or something like that. But is that what Animal Song? Um, I don't remember. They have so much material now. It's yeah. crazy. When I looked them up at first, I was like, "Oh wow, how new is this band?" But they already had like five albums worth of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What one of the big things I really like about Wolfpack is that they're when I have a bunch of friends around that maybe aren't as musically inclined, I can put on Wolfpack. And people are like, this is really cool. Like, yeah, yeah. Appealing to the masses while being very interesting. Like, it's appealing to me as a musician as well. Whereas Umphreys, I, you know, if I pick the right song, I can, I can get non musicians into it. But Wolfpack, it's like, people are like, this is so, so fun to listen to. Yeah. 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 Sure. It's just mass appeal, man. Like, they yeah. Have it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys know <clears throat> their story either because I don't yeah. fully remember all the details right now, but like how they took over Spotify and stuff and they had their like silent album and stuff like that. I did so, not hear any of that. Oh yeah, man. And um, oh, man, names are just escaping me. It's the morning, but uh, you, you need uh, coffee, not water in your, yeah, in your you cup. <laughs> but, uh, or that's why we're called Fet Buzz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, yeah. however yeah. however you gotta want to get it <laughs> <laughs> but uh um i think his name's jack strat 
He's the guy with the glasses you always see. He's always the one changing instruments. Like, mm, okay. Of, um, less beard, uh, taller. He's usually playing guitar or some part of the drums. Like, uh, you guys know the song Dean Town? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. That's one of my favorite phrases ever. Do, 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 do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those guys, when they're playing it, and Joe just starts with the do, 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 you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah, yeah. The crowd sings the whole bass phrase. Uh, the whole crowd is like, do, ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba. And there's like, I mean, like, tens of thousands of people singing a bass line that's that awesome it's epic like you yeah. know you've done your job as a bass player when you accomplish that yep yeah speaking yeah. of Volpec's like crowd involvement when i was at lockin they they opened lockin a couple years ago um lockin festival and it's near charlottesville virginia in arrington but, uh, <clears throat> they actually had the different sections of the crowd sing the harmony <laughs> they were like, pretty successful it was they had three a three-part harmony going with really? like twenty thousand people it, i mean <laughs> obviously not everybody was getting it but it was right. good enough to be you could hear the you could hear it yeah that's it was interesting really cool it would that, be interesting to hear that from the stage. I'm sure from, right. from within the crowd, that would be hard to hear the harmonies, but on stage to be actually be able to hear all the different parts, that yep. would be really interesting. Yeah. Man. He like had each section sing their part. Like he did like three takes with each section. He's like, okay, everybody ready to do it together? <laughs> oh man, that's the coolest thing yeah. ever. While the wow. band was doing, you know, the band just kept playing. Yeah. That's yeah. sick. Yeah, Volpec's yeah. worth checking out. Oh yeah. man, they're a game changer, dude. Yeah. yeah.